I'm still trying to get my head around how this is distinct from meditation. So, you know, I meditate most days. Usually, usually I focus on a mantra. So I'm repeating that mantra over in my mind. And if my attention kind of drifts away, then I just try and pull it back to, to the mantra. So I'm, I'm narrowing my focus. Sometimes I'll do it with breath. And, and I know a lot of people just focus on the breath, which is a kind of another way of narrowing the focus and entering that kind of state of meditation. How is that different to what you described at the start of this conversation where you're cueing people through you know, lying in the, in, in the bathtub, floating in water, and then the screen that you, you spoke about? That seems to also be, I guess, narrowing the focus a little bit. What's, what's different about this experience that someone would feel and what's different that we understand with regards to what's happening in the brain. In the brain, I'll be glad to answer that. So um, the, the first, I'll, I'll start with maybe a story about a woman who was an experienced meditator, you know, twice a day for 10 years. And she had migraine headaches. And she said, I love meditation, it's great, but I still have these damn migraines and I hate them, you know, and they just immobilize me, I can't stand them. And um, so I had her do hypnosis and focus on the problem. So one thing with meditation is it's a way of being and you're just meant to be to have open presence to let thoughts and feelings flow through you, non-judgmental. You don't fight against them. You don't struggle with them. You just let them happen. But you're not doing it initially to solve a problem. You're just doing it to be different and to calm your mind um, and, and to develop a sense of compassion do a body scan, but not, not do anything. It's Eastern, you know, it, and, and I said, I'm going to imagine you've got a skull cap on that's full of ice and you're going to feel a sense of cool, tingling numbness to filter the hurt out of the pain. And she came back and she said, you know, doc, my migraines are gone now. And I want to thank you for freeing my intentionality. Because one of the things about meditation is you're not supposed to, intention is the problem. You've got to get over yourself in, in meditation and, and get out of the way. Get out of the way and right. just let whatever is going to happen happen. Whereas in hypnosis, you're in hypnosis, you're purposefully engaging with the trauma or the pain That's or the right. habit. That's exactly right. So you're focusing on it. You're trying to do something about it to solve it, uh, and so it's Western. You know, you do it for a purpose. I don't. I think it's nice when people enjoy feeling. You know using hypnosis to just focus or feel better but but my goal is not to have a bunch of people walking around hypnotized um it's to help them use it to solve a problem and so it's got intentionality it's got purpose and you you try to do things with your perception you're you're not just open to it you try to change it and you can remember so afterwards you come out of this state you can recall that experience, which then I, I presume is what allows for integration? Usually, usually you can, that's right. But sometimes people can kind of come to some integration in the hypnotic state, feel more resolved about it, and not necessarily have to rethink it after they've done it. They just, I feel different. I have had people say, I feel lighter. You know, I've been carrying this burden around and they don't, they're not always clear why they feel lighter, but they feel different about what it was that had them so upset and they feel better. So it, it's more purposeful. Now, from the point of view, you ask about what's going on in the brain, there are real differences. So in, in hypnosis, we found that three things happen. You turn down activity in the anterior cingulate cortex, the dorsal part of it. This is a, the, the cingulate is like a C resting on its ends in the middle of your brain. And the front part is part of that salience network that the alarm goes off when you hear a loud noise. You hear, you hear a gunshot and you think, oh my God, what is that? You know, um, whereas if you turn down activity in that region, uh, you can allow yourself to focus. And we've done studies that show that that part of the brain in highly hypnotizable people has more uh, GABA activity. GABA, gamma amino butyric acid is an inhibitory neurotransmitter um, that is stimulated by anti-anxiety drugs and by sedative hypnotic drugs, the benzodiazepine class. And so you've got your own little pharmacy there, particularly if you're very hypnotizable, 
that can shut down your anxiety and, and help you control pain as well. So that's one thing that happens in hypnosis. You want to ask your question? I can yeah. Say yeah. I, I want to, I want to help the listener understand what it feels like to be in that state. So let's say, for example, I, I mentioned there that I've had a few poor nights sleep and I want to use this. Is it, is it just the outcome that I'm looking at to determine if I'm hypnotizable and this is effective? So I'm looking at, does it help me get back to sleep? Or when I'm going through and listening to you speak to me, are there certain things that indicate that I am in a, I'm in a hypnosis state? Yeah, we, uh, one thing if we ask people to do is to, to rate at the beginning, how stressed are you on a zero to 10 scale right now? And then to consider in a few minutes how stressed you are um, after you've been doing the exercise. Does your body feel more comfortable and relaxed? Because part of the way hypnosis works with stress and focus is you we do it from the body up rather than the, the head down. We sort of say, get your body floating and comfortable. Does it feel different? Do you, do you feel lighter? Do you feel like you're floating? Is the is your painful area warmer or cooler? Can you filter the hurt out of the pain? So you experience, you take stock of how your body is feeling, how you're feeling, and decide whether it's helping them. Whereas in, in meditation, you're, you're, you shouldn't be taking stock. That evaluation is considered a kind of breach with the idea of just open presence. And, and I think that's a very interesting idea too. It can be helpful, but it is different. And, and what happens in the brain is that in meditators, and Judd Brewer has done some beautiful research on this shows that as people become experienced meditators, they turn down activity in the other, the back part of the anterior cingulate cortex. We call that the default mode network. Uh, Judd talked about this, that it's the part of your brain that is active when you're not doing too much of anything else. You're evaluating yourself, evaluating what you can do, what people think of you. And that is getting over yourself in meditation. Activity goes down. In hypnosis, the more you're doing hypnotic work, the more you're turning down activity in that region. So that's where we see very rapidly cognitive flexibility, where you're just, you're, that voice that says, I shouldn't be doing this, people won't like this, you know, my mother wouldn't approve, whatever it is, um, gets shut down to the extent that you're engaged in the hypnotic activity. So that part of the reaction is is similar, but it's more of a trait change in meditators, whereas it's a state change in hypnosis. While you're doing it, that happens. And the third thing in hypnosis um, is that you have more connectivity between your executive control region and the frontal cortex and the insula, which is a mind-body relay. So you can very effectively control things in your body that you wouldn't think you can control. Um, we did one experiment where we took people, got them in the lab first thing in the morning, highly hypnotizable, and had them eat imaginary meals. And then we measured their gastric acid. You asked about irritable bowel syndrome. And we got an 89% decrease in gastric acid secretion when they thought about anything except food and drink. Um, and then um, we, uh, we had them concentrate on something else. And it didn't have any effect on the gastric acid secretion. And then we gave them pentagastrin, which stimulates gastric acid secretion. And we still had a 19% reduction in hypnosis. So the, the brain and the body interact very tightly uh, through hypnosis. Mm -hmm.